Hello and you are very welcome to the Future of Port Cities seminar where we will meet and learn from local and international partners who will discuss innovation for sport, solidarity and social inclusion in our cities. I'm just going to share screen because I put together a few slides for today. Um, to help me and to help you but this event runs as part of Cork Harbour Festival. This is the largest annual festival in Cork Harbour run over 11 days celebrating Cork's maritime culture. So the festival celebrates over 50 events happening in Cork City as well as across Cork Harbour in 15 beautiful locations. If you haven't been to Cork or even if you have been to Cork like it took me a long time to realize how Cork was laid out like you can get from one part to another on a ferry in like five or ten minutes but if you're to drive all the way around to that other place it's like 40 minutes in the car and just seeing that interconnectivity of the way that it is laid out is actually very similar to the interconnectivity of port cities as well, which I'm just almost learning. But also, um, I was involved with Cork Harbour Festival a few years ago. I was making a TV show and I got to cover the Cork Harbour Festival's flagship event, which is called Ocean to City. It's on Ross Moor, the big race in Irish, and it's at the heart of the celebrations. And uh, so we went out and we filmed kind of the full day. So then last night I was like, I'm going to pull out some of that footage and see if I can you know pull together a short montage and um, so I stayed up way too late pulling some footage together and editing it together now you'll notice that the quality of the footage isn't as good as the quality today but uh, hopefully it gives you some insight to what happens in this flagship event for Cork Harbour Festival. Now, I'm noticing as I get older that we are becoming more involved with the harbour, which is amazing. But today we're going to hear from those who are behind the scenes in creating the vision, the mission and the actions to really get people moving and bring them together locally as well as internationally for the betterment of our daily lives. In our increasingly diverse cities, festivals, sport and physical activity play a key role in supporting health, well-being, integration, solidarity, inclusion and belonging. So today we'll explore themes of body and movement sport, physical activity and innovation and this will hopefully help us to consider how together we can rise to the challenge to create healthy, inclusive and sustainable futures for our port cities. So before I introduce the speakers I just want to mention some of the organisations who are taking part in today's event because it really does take a huge network of collaborators to create a sustainable future. I worked in University College Cork um, in one of their subsidiaries for five years and it's where I got an insight to all of these positive projects happening across the universities that sometimes people don't even hear about. You know, it's funny, like we know everything that's going on in a reality TV show in a different country and then we're not really sure what's going on in our local community and internationally with the connections that are being made and the projects that people are working on. That's why events like this are so positive and powerful because they make you realise who is involved and what they're doing behind the scenes to pull all of this stuff together. So the event is organised as part of UCC's work with Unique European University City Labs. Most of the members of Unique are also port cities, interestingly, and UCC is a member of the Port Cities University Alliance. And the aim of this is, is really to develop a global network among port cities and universities and exchange ideas. Like I never really thought of it, how much port cities would have in common 
in terms of history, trade, industry, you know, festivals, maritime research, all of that kind of thing. It was only when Kira actually got in touch with me, I was like, of course, like we've all kind of grown up the same way with probably the same people hopping between the different ports at different stages and things. So it actually makes the world feel a lot smaller back then, even though it's quite small now with communication, it felt much larger back then, but that kind of even makes it feel a little bit smaller. Then a flagship event for new, Unique this year is um, the, sorry, we also have speakers from Yokohama National University just to show how far this reaches and Spore Istanbul. Then here more locally, we have a speaker from the Global Design Challenge. Now in its third year, the Global Design Challenge for Sport and Physical Activity, it crowdsources radical and innovative ideas that enable people of all ages and abilities to lead active and healthy lifestyles. So ideas come literally from all over the globe. Teams can be from anywhere in the world and they can work remotely with each other to come up with new ideas for collaboration and innovation in sport and we'll hear from a speaker with that too. I'll introduce all of the speakers in a second. And at the end of today's programme, I will also tell you how you can get involved with the Global Design Challenge. We are also delighted to have some fascinating insights from UCC's Department of Theatre. And because, you know, sport isn't just you know, sport as maybe some people would have traditionally associated with, you know, soccer, rugby, tennis. Sport is, and physical activity especially, is movement which is very much a part of theatre and um, and dance. And uh, we'll hear from a, a really amazing speaker there too. And we'll also hear from UCC Sport, who do incredibly valuable work for sport in Cork and beyond. So tying into physical activity is so much more than we've traditionally categorised it as. And that is why we have brought everyone here together today. The event is broken into two parts. In the first part, each of our speakers will give a presentation about innovating for sustainable futures towards health, well-being, inclusion and solidarity with our cities. First up, we have Dr. Fiona Chambers, the head of school of, sorry, the head of school of education and founder of the Global Design Challenge for Sport and Physical Activity. We also have Jeff Gomez, a PhD, is in the UCC Sport Performance Manager and entrepreneur with UCC's incubator Ignite 22. We'll also hear from Dr Yvonne Bonifan. He is an artist researcher and head of department of theatre at University College Cork. Then we will go to um, Tokyo and hear from Professor Ichiro Araki, Port University League, from the Port University League at Yokohama National University in Tokyo. This is always the part that trips me up, the names and, uh, and the titles. And then we will have the second part of today where we will have a panel discussion to further allow for collaboration of ideas and make maybe even talk about some actions for the future. Here we'll also be joined in this section by Mr. René Onor, the General Manager and Board Member at Spore Istanbul, Istanbul Municipality and Unique City Partner. If you've any questions for the speakers throughout the session, please add them to the chat and I will do my very best to cover them in the panel discussion. Um, So please do use this as well to discuss between yourselves um, uh, around the different topics. Now, I am going to go straight in to to introducing the first panelist. So I will stop sharing my screen and allow someone else to take over. Our first speaker, without further ado, is Dr. Fiona Chambers. Fiona is the Head of School of Education and founder of the Global Design Challenge for Sport and Physical Activity. Now, I've already said a few things about the Global Design Challenge, but what I will say is Fiona is one of these people who makes things happen. And she makes things happen with kindness. I'm always amazed at what she pulls off in what seems like an extraordinary amount of time, small, short amount of time, and the amount of people that she can bring in to make things happen. She's really, really inspiring. And the Global Design Challenge helped so many people during the pandemic to have something outside of themselves that they could work towards. And I won't speak about it anymore. I will hand right over to Fiona, who can tell you more about it. Thanks a million, Judy. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Uh, just two seconds. Um, now, yeah, I'll just pass across. And I just need you to just make sure that you you can see it uh, when I start sharing. So can you see that there, Judy? I can see your desktop, Fiona. Yep. And you can see the actual presentation. I can't not? see the presentation, just your desktop background. That wouldn't be great, really. That's a fantastic <laughs> introduction, isn't it? It was a lovely background, though. <laughs> I'd, say, I'd say it was really beautiful. So <laughs> this one? Is that perfect? Better? I'm seeing the slide perfect. deck. Yeah. Excellent, which is what I need you to see. So I'm just going to start uh, go full screen. 
Now, everybody can see that clearly, hopefully. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking it that everybody can see that clearly. So I'm going to start. So you gave me a very generous introduction, uh, Judy. So thank you sincerely. And you've been heavily involved in the Global Design Challenge for Sport and Physical Activity for the past uh, two years. We're now in our third year, which is kind of very exciting. So people are probably saying, what is this Global Design Challenge? So essentially the Global Design Challenge is, um, as we call it here, a global innovation engine. And it uses this thing called design thinking uh, to crowdsource ideas um, for incubation. And probably the most important word on the slide is impact. And for me, I certainly believe that the design thinking aspect to what we're doing um, is really core. And what I mean by design thinking, it's something which basically relies on empathy and really figuring out what matters to people in terms of wicked problems and then trying to come up with really innovative solutions that, that actually address those problems. We had a fantastic graphic harvester who worked with us in the past year on the Global Design Challenge. Her name is Maya Thomas and she really captured it beautifully and you can see words jumping out from the screen here like sustainability and education uh, the idea of networking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you also will see on this slide UNESCO's brand, and UNESCO very, very happily and luckily for us became our patron last year, and that was wonderful. We also had significant funding from Sport Ireland to really make it happen. So you're probably saying, okay, that's fine. Well, what is your North Star? And certainly from our point of view, our vision and our mission, and um, the vision is a world where everyone has a right to enjoy health and well-being benefits of being physically active across the lifespan. So that's something really dear to our heart. And our mission is to support the creation and the development of new innovative ideas from all over the world that help and enable people of all ages and all abilities to lead active, healthy lives. We have a number of different goals and um, there are eight of them in, in total. And I'm just going to call them out, just the, just the, the high level, uh, I suppose, um, aspects of each of them. So the very first one is the innovation aspect. You'll notice sustain, sustainable development goals are very, very uh, core to what we're doing. We want to basically um, come up with innovative ideas that, that reach sustainable behavior change. So it's not kind of short lived, something that really will actually move, move people literally. It's a global competition. We're really interested in not just um, coming up with ideas, it's about piloting them and also scaling them. We're trying to connect individuals and organizations across the world to try and, and, and come up with these fantastic ideas. So it's kind of interesting in that respect as well. Also connecting policy and grassroots, which is often a difficult and tricky area. And again, as I've called out, uh, the, the design thinking is absolutely core to what we do, that mindset, that can-do mindset, that optimistic and empathic mindset. We have sustainable development goals um, as a direction of travel, but we've actually gone a little bit further in that, in that we're actually being guided by the Kazan Action Plan uh, from 2017. So you'll see here there are seven core SDGs that we're interested in targeting through the innovations the teams actually come up with. And in terms of the, the team that are behind this, because I mean, you, you talk, talked about it earlier, Judy. There are so many people behind the Global Design Challenge, but there is actually a core team across our university and it's fueled by these energetic people. So they're at the heart of it. And I know, Judy, you're very involved in it also. So we have this common bond as a team because we all have this desire to actually make the world better, roll up our sleeves and to attack these really complex problems using design thinking. So that's what we're about. But this is the core team behind what's, what's going on. And then if we were to zoom out, these are all the wow partners that move literally with us to try and tackle physical inactivity around the world. And we literally, from the moment this began, which was at my kitchen table on a scrap of paper, I opened up my own Rolodex. I contacted all my friends, my colleagues, my academic colleagues, etc., across the world. And they opened up their address books and off they went. And we have grown quite a considerable set of partners across the world. I suppose to try and maybe situate it, I call it an entrepreneurial ecosystem. And when I've mapped it onto of what we're actually doing, you can actually see that every single aspect of that entrepreneurial ecosystem um, has a deliverable from the Global Design Challenge. So everything from the government policy and how we've been directed there to this one that I want to really call out here, the universities as catalysts. And we are unbelievably fortunate that we have 
unique city labs um, very, very um, supportive and pushing us forward as their flagship initiative um, this year. So we are unbelievably fortunate to have that kind of support. In terms of impact and how we've been doing so far, in 2020, it was really, as you know, this, this terrible time worldwide, and we wanted a bit of hope, this kind of shining light in the midst of all the crazy, awful, awful experiences that we were having. So in that particular year, we had 187 teams competing, and they competed on a platform called DevPost. There were 40 countries across 12 time zones, and we matched the teams that came through that with partners, and they went into an incubation phase. We had mentors on hand to support them, many of whom were from University College Cork alumni. And we had three international observers that particular year, UNESCO, the World Health Organization, and the Commonwealth Secretariat. Overall, we had about 10,000 volunteer hours across organizers, partners, judges, mentors, and teams. If we sprint forward into last year, again, we got bigger, which was kind of fabulous. Uh, we had funding, of course, from Sport Ireland, which really helped us enormously. And again, our reach was actually getting bigger. We were reaching as well into developing countries as well as developed countries. And we had these development grants to try and support ideas that came through. UNESCO also, the UNESCO chair down in MTU um, in Tralee also gave, gave some, uh, some prizes or development funds to really support particularly countries uh, from the, the developing world. We had UNESCO patronage. And we had two winning teams entering the, the um, UCC um, incubator called Ignite UCC, and one of whom is going to speak to you a little bit later. So again, it was really, really special. We had a very strong research focus um, last year, and we're going to continue to do that um, in, into this third year of Global Design Challenge. So overall, the impact so far has been reach, networking, education. That's actually probably the key thing for me. It's all about building capability and innovation, um, and in design thinking. So this was really powerful and I'll speak about that in a moment. We had our um, SDG impact tool working with UNESCO on that, the incubation of some winners by the Ignite UCC and this volunteerism, which has been quite astonishing, as I say, plus the range and the volume of ideas that are finally getting on their feet. So a couple of exemplars. We have basically um, one, one gentleman who's from, from Germany with his team, and he came up with an idea called uh, Pressful, Project Pressful. So his name is, is Anton Kluwischke, and he has worked with UNESCO in relation to developing this, um, this really special um, innovation that works with clubs to try and really advocate for human rights through sport. And it has been really game changing. So if you have a look on, on LinkedIn, you can actually see how that particular project is thriving. The second project, and again, Jeff is going to speak to you a little bit later, is this fantastic athlete hub uh, innovation. And that has been really one of the most special projects to really come out of the Global Design Challenge. That is currently in, in Ignite UCC, our incubator, and it's just so exciting to actually watch this project start to unfold. Again, I'm not going to, to do the spoiler alert. I'm going to allow Jeff to speak more fully about that a little bit later. So in 2022, this is what we're trying to do. Design innovative ways of increasing participation in sport and physical activity in an inclusive and sustainable and fun way. Teams can pick two of these sub challenges, which I, I've, I've um, listed here. So around inclusion, community, fans and volunteers, policy based, sustainability, youth based, technology based or lifestyle physical activity. So one or two of those. Um, and just to flag with you that we've actually kicked this off. We kicked it off in the, the World Expo in Dubai back in January. We've already had our warm up and you can look to our website to see that in action. And our timeline is basically this. I need you to set your crosshairs on the actual competition window, which is between the 10th and 14th of October. We will be sending out some really, really interesting, um, I suppose, supports for all of you. So webinars on design thinking, on video pitching with yourself, Judy, and linking your innovation ideas to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. You will also get access to mentor panel feedback if you decide to become involved in our competition, international networking, and those teams that are really fortunate will get incubation tokens, and they will enter incubators either in UCC or in our partner universities. So if you enter and you decide to, to go for this, I need you to build a team, choose your sub challenges, register, learn through our webinars, compete, submit, 
and stay, as I say, I would say from, from this point forward, just stay connected in terms of what's happening next in relation to the global design challenge. It's a really exciting moment for us. We can't wait for you to get involved. And we are so, so thrilled that Unique City Labs are working with us this year, as well as the University of East London uh, Global Partnership for Good in Sport. So thank you so much, Judy. I'm going to pass back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona, for that amazing, or I suppose, overview of the Global Design Challenge. I have met people who have taken part in the Global Design Challenge over the years. And, you know, one person I knew who was from the States got involved. Another guy I know got to the incubation stage. And hearing the story from beginning to end, I think, is, is what's really important about this. And that brings us to our next speaker. We have Jeff Gomez, PhD, UCC Sport Performance Manager and Ignite 22 Entrepreneur for the those who don't know what Ignite is, it's it's UCC's, Fiona already mentioned it, but it's UCC's incubation hub really where entrepreneurs are all brought together and given the tools and the, the support necessary to bring their idea to market. So a Global Design Challenge 2021 finalist, Jeff is invited to share insights from his own career, including as head, as head high performance coach from UCC and tell his Global Design Challenge story of idea to incubation. Over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Judy. Uh, it's going to be hard to uh, follow up on such a great presentation from, from Fiona, but no, I'll, gi I'll give it a go. Uh, I didn't put a presentation together, so I'll, I'll briefly give you a, an overview of um, who I am. And so, um, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm Jeff Gomez. Um, my background is I have a PhD from the School of Education from, from UCC, and I'm currently the um, a performance manager for UCC Sports. So UCC Sports uh, and global around, around 65 different clubs and provide uh, sporting activities for uh, UCC students. And uh, we have around 120 scholarships. And my job is to make sure that um, scholarships are able to reach their full potential as athletes and um, as scholars. So um, why Global Design Challenge? Uh, specifically because uh, years after years, uh, through my own experience, um, I had some frustration arising from seeing athletes and student athletes wanted to develop themselves, but kept, uh, kept encountering the same, uh, the same barrier. Um, and um, I think Global Design Challenge came at the right moment. It allowed me to really to tap in into a wealth of resources, and not only to uh, allow me to firm up my project and what I wanted to do with it. But once I reached the final, which I, I was, I was surprised in a way. I was like, "Wow, I, I want to, I want to something there. It, it is great." Uh, not only that, but once the global uh, design challenge was over, uh, it really opened the door to me to a wealth of connection. And following that, Emin Cotton, who, who, who sit at the, um, who's part of the global design challenge, Emin Cotton uh, is the director of Ignite, who's an incubator in, in UCC. And uh, he approached me and said, look, I think you're onto a great project. Would you be willing to join Ignite? And uh, so I took part into um, a few evening session with Ignite, they have a, a six weeks lab um, and uh, allow a participant to really firm up the idea and to look at the potential to, to, to really uh, work on their pitch. And since uh, April, I've joined Ignite full time. And now I'm putting together um, a company it's called Athlete Hub. And my ambition is to really to disrupt the way we support athletes aged from 15 years of age and all the way to 77, 80, 85, uh, and to really uh, empower athletes to make a better decision. Why? Because at the moment, um, we see a couple of things. Uh, for example, if you're a student athlete, there are 33% of them will suffer from severe anxiety and mental health issues. And one of the issues that there is is, we have monitoring devices that tell us, you know, we are stressed, but what do you do after that? Who do you talk to? And if you want to talk to someone sometimes that this, the, the system is designed to be uh, reactive and not proactive. So um, Athlete Hub is designed to connect people with um, better solutions. So there's a monitoring station, 
there's an education stations, and there is support services. So if you need to talk to a nutritionist, someone is there to talk to you. If you need to talk to a performance manager, someone is there to empower you to make better decisions. If you need to talk to a sport psychologist, you can have one, you can talk to a sport psychologist at a click of a button. And at the moment, um, the sport system is awash with monitoring devices and to some extent with some educational components, but there is no, there is no platform at the moment that really truly connect people. And I think that's what at the heart of the global design challenge is to really truly connect people from different strands. And really what I want to do with, with that project is to allow everyone to have excellent support services. It doesn't matter if a 15 year old uh, athlete who want to play GEA, and aspire to be an inter-county athlete for Cork. It doesn't matter if you are a weekend warrior who want to do an Ironman or a triathlon and um, train on the side of your 39 hour walk, but is unsure about his nutrition. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a student athlete. Um, my ambition is to give everybody the same tools to allow them to make better decisions and to fully perform to the best of their abilities. And, uh, and that's my ambition. And that's where I am at the moment. And I can emphasize how uh, Global Design Challenge really helped me to be on that pathway. Uh, my ambition is to apply for an accelerator in Indianapolis uh, next March, April. And uh, I think at the start of uh, the discussion, uh, you mentioned that Fiona Chambers was one of those persons that really make things happen. Not only she make things happen, but she's extremely kind and she is really a, a wealth of optimism. Uh, there is really no barriers. And, uh, and I think that's why Global Design Challenge is doing so well because they such an incredible person at the helm and able to bring all those people together. Amazing. So, thank you, Judy. Thank you so much, Jeff. And we'll be back to you again later on during the panel discussion. So so hold on there for now. But it was really good to hear your story. It just doesn't it just bring to life like a concept and then you hear someone actually talk about it and you can almost like visualize the journey that you were on to get from where you are now, where you were to where you are now, which is um, fascinating. So we're going to stay within the, the grounds of UCC. Um, you're probably not in UCC today, Yvonne, but we're going to speak to Dr. Yvonne Bonifon, uh, artist, researcher and head of Department of Theatre at University College Cork. Dr. Bonifon is invited to provide a contribution, taking a lens on our embodied selves in the city, considering themes of engagement in movement and physical activity, performance and play, and co-creating a personal and or a collective sense of health, well-being, solidarity and belonging. Over to you, Yvonne. Hi. Well, thanks. Um, and I'm delighted to be here with people who are interested in sport because we um, in theatre and performance have something in common with people from the sport world, which is that we have to be finely attuned to the nature of what our bodies are doing and how and how they're expressing themselves in public space and on the stage. Um, and we develop kind of a sensory engagement with that uh, refined um, uh, sense of um, preoccupation with the body that's very particular in our case. And I guess one of my roles here this morning is simply to make a plea in terms of how the port cities are thinking of developing policy. And that's that alongside the very important contribution that movement, sport, and um, uh, sport, sporting activity made to the sense of well-being, what we from the performative world can add into the mix is actually a very strong emphasis on how that engagement with feeling and moving and sensory uh, um, refinement of how we relate to the world also can contribute to a genuine sense of creative play. And what it actually means to take play and what playing is seriously in the public spaces of our port cities and how taking that seriously can contribute to different kinds of different feelings of well-being, belonging, and also giving people the right to feel that they take up space. So I thought I would do that through showing you a few examples of 
projects that have helped me think about how the body takes up space and this relationship to the body feeling pleasure in play in public in our complex urban environments of today. So I'm just going to screen share with you. Right. So I'm going to show you a tiny snippet of a project that raised my interest in this topic. This is really <laughs> There is a company from Toronto who are actually going to be performing in the Midsummer Festival shortly, um, their piece Night Walks with Teenagers called Mammalian Diving Reflex. And one thing that the founder of Mammalian Di Diving Reflex has talked about with regards to performance interventions in public space is thinking of bodies in public space as social acupuncture. If when we watch other bodies, we actually mimetically copy their actions. If seeing performing bodies opens up possibilities for our own bodies to copy, what might it mean if those bodies are doing something very different from what we normally see in public space? And here is the ensemble, the Galloping Cuckoos, working on an exploratory project of mine called The Opposite of Trauma, where they were trying to embed movements that were somehow not trauma, but the opposite of trauma into walks they took through key cities. And during those walks, they then had really interesting public reactions. You don't see many or all of them in this documentation. But um, what we actually ended up calling the work was double team performance. Often people would walk by and then I show you this little snippets of documentation to raise this idea that the moving body in public space and well-being isn't only about athletic performance and exercise and those activities, but it's also about exploring possibilities for who else we can be and how else we can express ourselves. On that note, I show you a little bit of the work of Japanese artist working in Berlin, Mika Satomi. Mika Satomi does super interesting projects using smart technologies to reconstruct urban space. Here from her piece, Smart Rituals, is an image of people who took a workshop with Mika and her company in the morning and made these costumes animated by sensor technology. This piece of work actually attempts to reconstruct uh, what they do is they interact with actually the mobile phone monitoring technologies that happen throughout urban space and they've designed their movement through that space in these playful and crazy costumes to create new forms of ritual that would take place on monitoring maps that people might watch, that city authorities might watch as they see people's sensors move through their mapping and monitoring of space. Monitoring that they usually do to uh, engender uh, crowd control or monitor um, various types of crime that may be taking place. And here we see down in this video some of how the public engaged with these movements through the city and how they sometimes witness, sometimes ask questions. Okay, so then how loud is this place? often take photos, and here they are being mapped by crowd mapping technology, seeing exactly where they're moving and how and why, 
And so these extended bodies, these bodies extending themselves through the costume, involve passers-by and witnessing and copying and playfulness in whole other ways that we might think about as being really important to how our cities configure themselves for playful futures. Many of you will have heard of or witnessed the very interesting uh, crowd-based nudity installations of the artist Spencer Tunick in public space. Here in, uh, I believe this is Mexico City, that's right, in Mexico City, we see literally hundreds and hundreds, and sometimes Tunic brings thousands of participants who will come, take off their clothes, and be part of giant performative installations where they're photographed. This is really, really interesting to think of all the bodies who don't usually get to take up public space and who certainly don't get to be seen as full embodied entities occupying urban space in really interesting ways and providing yet again really interesting opportunities. Here are lots of naked bodies on buildings in the Netherlands. I'm sure some of you have come across Spencer Tunick's work before. Spencer Tunick has done work also in Dublin. Here we have uh, reconfiguration in Chile. And through these bodies coming in and taking up space, the act of being in the photo invites you to inhabit your own city in a whole new way. In a way, these photos, his installation photos, are just documentation of a moment where all of these people who don't know each other come together and share a different way of bodies being than the carefully policed manners in which we usually inhabit our public space. And finally, we might swing around some more examples of this discourse to Cork's own Dragon of Shandon events run by the company um, Cork Community Art Link, who involve literally hundreds and hundreds of people from the community in the making of puppets from waste materials and plastic that become part of an enormous public spectacle in which children and all kinds of other people from all over the city take part in parading their costume selves in a celebratory environment that again stages bodies in public space in ways that a lot of people don't get to actually inhabit that space. I hope what I've shown you in this brief survey, I'm just coming up to 10 minutes, I hope what I've managed to do is really raise some questions for us today about how the body as physical phenomenon, how the body as a component, people's own bodies, a component of the flow in urban space, of how often our urban spaces often don't make space for our bodies to be in them in creative and self-expressive ways. And how one of the things the performative arts can bring to the table is how we invite people whose bodies are otherwise not there, who maybe don't consider themselves sporty or sport participants, who maybe don't consider themselves worthy of owning public space by using it, can be invited to actually take up that space, witness new kinds of embodiments in that space, respond to bodies showing different ways of being in that space and how we can use these dynamics to reconfigure how we think of what the design of our urban spaces does, how our physical activities give or don't give permission for people to indulge in the pleasure and creative fun and self-manifestation of saying, I also belong here in these public spaces and I have the right to exaggerate my creative self inside them and think about other ways we could be relating to each other to construct the urban relationships of the future between our living selves. Thanks. Stop Wonderful sharing. talk, Yvonne. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, you know, you, you kind of spoke to my soul when you said, firstly, that, you know, 
sport can be many things and movement my, my sport personally it's a one person sport is cleaning <laughs> I do an awful lot of cleaning especially when I'm stressed or if I'm feeling like I need exercise I clean up my house and stuff like that because and I think it's because the, of what you mentioned about the right of t- you, the, to feel the right to feel you can take up space I thought that was a very powerful um, thing to say because when I go into the city I almost try and like you know disguise myself through the crowd like I don't want to take up space I don't want to be seen I just want to get in and out not cause any issues not bash into someone you know like like I, I totally related to to so many things you said and by seeing people moving in that space you're like why could I, could I do that you know like could you do could you just stand there and do that without a camera being on you or without a festival being there to give you that permission to do it can you just do it you know so I have loads of questions for um, you and I'm sure a lot of people do in, in the in the in the discussion in the discussion later on because it's it's just a different twist um, which is which is really exciting so thank you so much for that um, now we are going to go um, across the globe um, because universities are working together locally with external societal partners and through international network and alliances all trying to collaborate for more sustainable futures so taking an international lens we're delighted to have Professor Iraqi to provide a number of contributions reflecting on how we can collaborate locally and globally to rise to the challenge to realise more sustainable and inclusive futures for our cities and our citizens. Over to you now Professor. Thank you Judy. Um, Okay let me share uh, the slide. Okay, can can you see the slide? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, thank you again. And um, well, uh, my part is a bit uh, different from uh, previous speakers. Uh, I, I am going to focus more on uh, uh, international aspect. And uh, the uh, first, uh, let me start with the uh, introduction of uh, my university, uh, Yokohama National University. Uh, which uh, happens to be in Yokohama, not in Tokyo. But uh, uh, to- Tokyo and Yokohama is very close. Uh, actually, I'm uh, speaking from my home, which is in Tokyo. But uh, Tokyo and Yokohama are about uh, uh, 30 kilometers uh, apart. So uh, it, it is, uh, uh, Yokohama is a distinct city, uh, uh, very close to uh, Tokyo, but uh, clearly a, a different city. And uh, also uh, traditionally, uh, it has served as uh, the, the Tokyo's gateway uh, to the outside world, uh, because uh, when um, the uh, the port of Yokohama uh, opened uh, in uh, 1859, uh, it was uh, one of the few uh, gateways for Japan uh, to uh, the outside outside world, and uh, the many things uh, are modern. Uh, started uh, in uh, Yokohama, such as uh, the production of beer or ice cream and all other uh, things. But uh, anyway, uh, Yokohama, uh, what you're seeing uh, above is uh, the port port of Yokohama. And uh, the area uh, uh, within this uh, yellow line uh, is uh, our campus. So uh, we are uh, the, not in the, uh, in the middle of uh, Yokohama port, but we are on the hill about five kilometers away from the port. And uh, this is uh, our campus. And uh, I don't want to spend too much time on, 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 the, on our, our principles, but these are the, our slogans. And uh, please note that be global uh, is one of our uh, uh, principles. So uh, uh, Yokohama National University uh, is trying to be a global university uh, and, uh, and through fostering exchange with uh, other nations. And then uh, just briefly, uh, we have about uh, 10,000 uh, uh, students uh, and uh, among them uh, about 8% are international students. This ratio is uh, uh, quite high uh, among uh, national university of Japan. And uh, we also have uh, uh, various international uh, networks, including this uh, Port City University League. 
and uh, the, the since uh, 2006, uh, we have been serving as a secretariat uh, of uh, this uh, uh, unique uh, alliance of universities called uh, the Port City Universities League. And uh, let me um, explain uh, a, li a little bit about this uh, 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 alliance among universities. So uh, this, uh, these are all in acronyms, but uh, uh, th these are the original members of the league. So uh, the, the HCMCUT uh, stands for Ho, Ho Chi Minh City uh, University of Technology uh, that's uh, in Vietnam. And then uh, the IITM is Indian Institute of Technology Madras. So it's a, a technical university in Chennai, India. And then uh, the Shanghai Jiaotong University, uh, that's a, it's a, 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 a big university in China. Then uh, University of Sao Paulo. Then uh, Soton is the University of Southampton. And then you know, Yokohama City University and uh, Yokohama National University. These uh, universities got together uh, to declare the establishment of the league. And uh, these are the sort of uh, the, the, the preambles uh, to uh, the declaration. So first uh, we uh, recognized uh, that the world's uh, port cities uh, share common interests and challenges regarding communication, trade, border control, industrial development, ocean and coastal management and environmental protection while enjoying their own unique history, tradition and culture. Then uh, the, the second uh, uh, recital to the, this uh, uh, preamble says uh, we, were we are determined to build upon the academic excellence of each participating institution uh, for further international cooperation. And then um, the, uh, for that purpose, uh, the, the, the league is a form to foster collaboration, excellence and innovation with a view toward uh, creating a global research and education base uh, for the participating institutions, as well as enhancing outreach activities toward local communities. And uh, the delegates from the participating institution of the league will meet regularly. And so th this, is, uh, this, this is what, what we have been doing. And then uh, the, the new membership is, it is, is a lot of uh, technical provision, but, but it is an open uh, uh, community. And uh, let me uh, uh, tell you a little bit about, about uh, uh, the, the, the background uh, to this uh, uh, unique uh, alliance. Actually, uh, it started uh, uh, from the conversation between um, uh, our faculty members and the faculty members of uh, the University of Southampton. So uh, when uh, those professors, uh, actually, uh, we, we, we do have a bilateral partnership agreement uh, uh, with the uh, University of Southampton. But uh, when we were negotiating this uh, uh, the bilateral partnership, uh, we noticed that uh, the University of Southampton and uh, Yokohama National University is uh, very similarly uh, located. They are both port city universities and, and, and they share uh, 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 certain uh, features, uh, uh, the certain history, and also uh, the, the way uh, how they interact with uh, the local government, etc. And um, they, we felt that uh, there are many other uh, universities in the world uh, which are similarly uh, located. And uh, then uh, this uh, uh, original members, uh, so the, the, the Ho Chi Minh City, uh, the, the support of Saigon, and then uh, Madras, uh, the, the port of Chennai, uh, Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is a little bit inland, but they do have uh, the port of Santos. And then, uh, then uh, the, the, the mission Shanghai, uh, anyway, Shanghai and Southampton, uh, these are ma ma major port cities. So uh, eventually uh, this league uh, uh, started to cover uh, other uh, other continents, and so University of British Columbia, uh, University of Lisbon, and then uh, two universities from Korea, uh, uh, Pukyon National University and also uh, Incheon National University. Then uh, through uh, uh, our connection with the University of Southampton, uh, someone at, at uh, Alexandria University got interested. And so Alexandria is there. 
and, and through uh, this professor uh, from Alexandria, uh, we got connected to uh, uh, King Abdulaziz University in Saudi Arabia. Then uh, the more recently, uh, also uh, oh, I almost forgot, Istanbul Technical University has been uh, is one of the uh, oldest members of this league, so uh, we 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 do have a connection uh, with Turkey. And then uh, more recently, uh, we have added uh, uh, some university from Belgium, uh, Ghent University, and then uh, the uh, uh, Smart Institute of Technology from India. Uh, the, uh, Indonesia, and, and last but not least, uh, University Co College Cork, uh, we, uh, have been, uh, has been a member of uh, the, this league uh, recently, but uh, as uh, 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 this uh, webinar shows, uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the University College Cork has been a very active member of this league. So uh, the, this has been how uh, uh, how we have expanded uh, our uh, geographical membership, and uh, this is uh, this shows uh, past events. Uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, uh, we have not been very active recently. But uh, as uh, uh, we, uh, as I will uh, come to that shortly, uh, the, uh, we have had the successful meeting uh, online uh, uh, last April. Uh, hosted uh, uh, by, by uh, our campus in, in Yokohama. But uh, anyway, uh, so going back first, uh, the, 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 we had a meeting in Chintao, Ho Chi Minh City, Incheon, um, Dalian, Sao Paulo, Istanbul, Tucson, Southampton, Shanghai, uh, Yokohama again, and then uh, Lisbon, Chennai. And uh, the, uh, the initial kickoff meeting uh, started uh, in Yokohama. So uh, we have about uh, 16 year history and we, uh, we have been uh, um, expanding uh, our activities uh, quite uh, globally. And this is, I think, the last slide. Uh, so uh, we did uh, have a successful workshop on ocean sustainability and ecology uh, last year. Uh, the, and uh, the, these countries, Brazil, China, India, Indonesia, Iran, Korea, and Japan, all these uh, countries participated. Uh, uh, online uh, to discuss the issue of uh, uh, ocean sustainability of uh, and ecology. You see the, uh, this. Uh, you see Professor Matsuda, uh, who is uh, uh, the, who is a biologist uh, 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 specializing in ecology, and he was uh, uh, instrumental in organizing this seminar. But uh, um, anyway, we have this potential of uh, uh, connecting with. Uh, uh, the uni universities all, all, all around the world. And uh, one of the unique features of this uh, both city universities league is that uh, we have always had uh, uh, the support of uh, the, the, the local cities and also uh, the, the, the sometimes uh, local ports. So uh, when we had th those meetings, uh, uh, we, we, uh, often uh, the, uh, our uh, activities uh, included the visit to the port and uh, the, not necessarily uh, to the city itself, but uh, we have tried to uh, encourage this connection uh, with, uh, with uh, local uh, governments and also the, the port authorities. And uh, this has been the, uh, the brief introduction to the uh, the, the, our league, Port, University, uh, Port City Universities League. And, um, I, and, and uh, going back to this, uh, 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 preambular language. Uh, the, uh, we, uh, uh, that we are aware that uh, uh, we share this uh, uh, the, the common uh, vision, but based on uh, our unique history, tradition, and culture. And so um, the, uh, certainly uh, we can expand uh, this uh, uh, network to cover uh, areas uh, we just talked about, including sport and also uh, performance arts and uh, uh, that would be a very uh, good uh, addition uh, to the coverage of uh, our activities. So with that, I think uh, I can finish my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for that great, I suppose, overview, especially of the, the Port City University League. I'm kind of um, like I'm I'm amazed at the 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 connectivity that ports cause, in, and and not mm -hmm. not connectivity of of products and and moving things across the ocean, but like mm -hmm. you know the having that shared history 
like I've only kind of realized that from being involved with this. Mm -hmm. And now I'm even more fascinated by it. And, you know, Yvonne said something about, you know, that we copy others. I wonder if, you know, by being part of this league, something has happened in one port somewhere else and a positive copy, maybe not even consciously or, or probably subconsciously mm-hmm. has taken place just as a result of this collaboration. And mm-hmm. um, I'll ask, actually ask you, Professor Iraqi, is that is that something that you've noticed that everyone pulls each other up? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, particularly uh, that happens uh, uh, in the area of education. So uh, we, we do this uh, joint workshop um, um, among the, the several members of this league. And then uh, the, uh, we report uh, the, the successful outcome of this uh, uh, international uh, joint seminar. And then uh, other members would uh, sort of copy <laughs> this uh, successful uh, experience. And uh, I, I think that has happened um, between uh, the universities in China and Korea. And uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, quite an, uh, an interesting experience. And uh, because uh, our league is uh, consisted of uh, professors from different faculties, so some of them are marine biologists, others are archaeologists, some, are, some of them are uh, the civil engineer, some of them are naval architects, and so uh, the, even within one university, uh, professors don't really uh, exchange their, their views uh, uh, so uh, so casually. But in this international setting, uh, the, there is always a chance to uh, expand uh, the, uh, the, the network and try something new uh, in your universities. And I hope. Uh, uh, we, we can uh, work together uh, with uh, uh, University College Cork uh, to, uh, to, to develop something, something interesting. Fantastic. And then to the idea, I suppose. So I'm going to start this this round table discussion part now, but we are going to have a speaker join us probably in a couple of minutes and I'll introduce mm-hmm. him separately. So I'll probably just finish up the question that we're on and then go and introduce the new speaker um, afterwards. Oh, perfect timing. Um, hello, <laughs> okay. Mr. Rene Onor. Um, I'll just introduce you and then I'll let you speak for a few minutes, if you don't mind, just introducing yourself and a bit about your background and then we'll begin our round table discussion. So Mr. Rene Onor is the general manager and board member at Spore Istanbul, Istanbul Bull Muni- God, Munipal- oh my God, I actually, I can't say that word and I've said it like 10 times today, so I'm just going to skip past it. I think you know what I mean. And he is the unique city partner. Istanbul is a city university partner in the unique European University Alliance. Mr. Onor is invited to share experiences from Spore Istanbul, promoting municipality working together with community and university, enabling us all to live a more active life from children right to the elderly and raising successful international athletes, sports people and social entrepreneurs. Over to you now, Rene, please. Okay, thank you very much, Judy, for your kind words. And uh, I'd like, I'm, I've been here for three years and the one of the main reasons probably why they proposed me to lead for Istanbul is I have a, a, a social entrepreneur background. I'm also an Ashoka fellow, and I set up platforms which are, uh, that are uh, increasing the mobility and increasing the sport awareness of uh, masses. So uh, yes, that was like around 150, 200,000 uh, sized communities. In this case, Istanbul is a huge city, 16 million, but that's actually almost the same thing that I'm trying to do here for Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality. It's a huge entity. We have 60 sport facilities, and in these 60 sport facilities, we are serving each year 1 million unique Istanbulians for 10 million times. And I'm actually the, one of the main uh, objective of uh, Sport Istanbul is uh, to have a healthy and of course happy Istanbul. And unfortunately, though Istanbul is, uh, Turkey is one of the youngest countries in Europe. Our average age is 33. Europe's average age is 44. 
still in terms of obesity and uh, type 2 diabetes, diabetes, Turkey is number one. And I'm sad to say, but I mean, the, the, the Turkey is, uh, I mean, we have to do something very uh, unique and we have to be looking for uh, policy changes. Otherwise, I mean, no matter what we do in other fields, uh, we will not be a healthy nation in 10 years time. If you look at uh, global, uh, the other, not only Europe, but all the world, uh, after states, in terms of countries over 50 million, Turkey is number two after states in terms of obesity. So we have to be quite uh, innovative uh, in terms of coming up with different policies and different projects. So that's why uh, I'm highly excited about this partnership between Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality, uh, Koch University, and with UNIQ, European University of Post-Industrial Cities. And because almost, okay, not all the cities uh, are 16 million, but I'm sure most of the big cities are trying to survive similar problems if they are not as uh, bad as uh, Turkey and Istanbul. I believe especially I mean, innovative solutions in increasing active cities uh, to serve the needs of obese cities to make them more active. We should be working, I'm um, highly working with academicians and different uh, universities. Uh, otherwise, I mean, I'm not very positive about the future of Istanbul. Uh, but I mean, being said that, I'm a positive guy. Uh, I think, uh, for example, currently we increased the number of uh, sport branches that we are teaching kids in Istanbul from seven to 17, because diversity is also important in terms of sport branches as well. Uh, every two months, we are teaching 29,000 kids, 17 branches. I mean, it's a huge uh, operation. And out of 29,000 uh, students, uh, we are selecting 1%, around 200, for uh, a specialized uh, sports school and 10% of these are immediately taken by sport clubs. So though our main objective is an active city, uh, I mean, by the help of the sports schools, we are also helping uh, sport clubs as well. Uh, so, I mean, mainly this is one of the most important that I'd like to share. Maybe I can also add in top, in addition to facilities, we are also organizing activities in Istanbul, sport activities, because uh, seeing sport activities also a motivation for people who are not uh, exercising. Uh, we, we organize around 40 different sport activities so that Istanbulians see, feel, and get motivated by uh, many different type of sport events. All these, I mean, facilities and activities uh, at the end of the day are mainly to solve the serious health problem of Istanbul. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that contribution. And, you know, I, I hope that people do realise that, you know, you and your team are, are there behind the scenes working on these problems in Istanbul because they probably, what makes the news is, is the bad news and the bad stats. And then you never really hear of, of who's working on this to actually try and solve it. So, again, another reason why I'm, I'm so grateful to have all of you here today. And thank you. So I'll move into now more of a round table. So what I'll do is I'll pol pose a question to one person. But if any of you feel like jumping in at any stage without like obviously, you know, interrupting the person completely. But at the end of when they start, when they finish what they're saying, feel free to, you know, have conversation with this because I think that's the best way to um to get kind of some answers that we need. So I'm going to start with you, Fiona, please, because I'd like to kind of understand the role 
especially that sports and physical activity have in supporting social inclusion and solidarity. And maybe even if you could start with what is meant by social inclusion and solidarity and then how sport and physical activity fit into that. Yeah, and, and that is one of the key agendas of the Global Design Challenge. Um, more and more we're seeing our cities becoming so diverse. They're diverse um, just in terms of ethnicity, all the different diversities you could possibly imagine. And we're, we have a sense that um, for, for inclusion to really matter, those everybody within a city has to feel they belong and that their identity is respected. And certainly from my point of view, I see sport and physical activity, not just competitive sport, but the physical activity side of things is a real opportunity to celebrate uh, the identity of a particular uh, person or a group of people. Uh, we saw it uh, at the weekend in our city in Cork uh, when we had our, our marathon and we had the sanctuary runners. And that particular, um, uh, that particular initiative is absolutely unbelievable because it is exactly that. It is showing how sport can glue lots of different diverse cultures together uh, to the purpose of, of actually running together and raising uh, charitable funds to try and try and help those, those people. So for me, social inclusion is one of the, the key challenges of our time. And it is about that fabulous, I use the word bricolage, a bricolage of identities that make up the richness of our cities. And the only way certainly for us to really um, to, to, to help people to feel they belong to our cities as they arrive in them, particularly with, with what's happening on currently with, with the war in Ukraine, is to, to, to be able to use mechanisms to, to help that to happen. And certainly from my point of view, one of the easier languages that people can grasp without you know, having to, to learn a new language is sport and physical activity. That's often a very fabulously uh, common language across the world. You don't need the verbals, you just can move, your body can move. Um, and, I, and I believe that sport and physical activity are certainly a language that is common and can really push forward that inclusion agenda, certainly from my point of view. Thanks, Judy. I love that idea of sport as a language. I mean, if you throw a ball at someone, they're going to catch it. <laughs> they're not going to say, I don't understand, you know, and let the ball hit them. So that is a really, really good analogy. I would also suggest that everyone who's listening or even part of the panel to go and follow the Sanctuary Runners. I think I follow them on Twitter and Instagram. And it's just such a positive story of you know just community and 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 get coming together of different people and just positive and you know positivity is something that um i think we all need more of um i'll go to jeff next um you know so you've designed something that actually connects people do you find then this idea of solidarity and and social inclusion comes from what you've created or would you feel that you've just seen it at a bigger level from your inclusion or from your job within sport within UCC. Do you see that solidarity around you? Yeah, well, for example, I would echo what, what Fiona was mentioning, uh, that the sport is, is a huge uh, medium of bringing people together, uh, especially we've seen it during COVID and isolation and people need to uh, play sports, to meet with each other. And uh, on a party, a couple of years ago, I was traveling and I was in India, in, in Goa, and I was on a beach in Palolem, and people, Indian, were playing cricket. And they came to me and said, do you want to play cricket? I said, no, I don't know how to play cricket. But, you know, but I, I took part in it, and it, it was absolutely fantastic. I have no idea to play cricket, but you know, it, it, playing sports bring people together. And it's what I want to do. What I want, my, my ambition is, is via... Uh, the, this platform that I'm developing is, is to uh, bring down barriers that uh, people cannot progress in the sport because of lack of funding. And it's try to bring this kind of togetherness, this inclusiveness by making tools available to people who have an ambition to compete and, or just to take part in sport, but they, they lack the proper information. And um, yeah, absolutely, this sport is, is bring down barriers and is a universal language. Excellent. Would anyone else like to answer on that one? No, that's fine. So, um, Yvonne, I have a question for you and uh, it's more my, my kind of personal question. Do you find sometimes that you get excluded from international or na national talks about sport 
and physical activity because sometimes people don't realise that movement is 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 a sport in itself or do you think that this is widening up and people are starting to include it more? I don't know. <laughs> My own uh, creative practice and scholarly field has a lot to do with dance and somatics even though i'm not a dancer and i don't choreograph i started my performance work in a choreographically led company so i don't think it's really a question of exclusion i think um the message that i was interested in in getting across is that uh i think what um you know, we say in English that one plays a sport and um, and it is play. And I think there are, for whatever reason, many people for whom the notion of play is not linked with the notion of sport. And I think, um, and I think there are many people from the sports field that recognize that, right? I think what um, what the performing arts have to bring to the table is an expertise around what makes play feel like play. And that when we bring that expertise around what makes play feel like play, and we bring that to the table with agendas that are looking at sport, we actually find ways to include a larger number of people than might otherwise be included. Um, and because this is a Port Cities event, uh, we also think a lot about uh, um, urban frameworks and what city design says to people about who belongs and who belongs where. And, you know, um, um, the sense of ownership of urban space has a lot to do with who will play in it. And I know many of us know in many of our daily lives, for example, women who would not jog certain places at certain times, who would not undertake certain kinds of physical activity because the urban space is not necessarily made safe for their bodies. So we really need to be also asking, and that's just one example. I mean, then we can talk about LGBT bodies and we can talk about um, uh, racialized bodies and how careful they are when they're in minority positions. So I think um, what we can bring to the table is a series of questions and a series of ways of doing that are about thinking about what strategies we can use to make those urban spaces playful for everybody and open up physical activity um, to people who might not see themselves as belonging in those spaces at all times. All activities, whether it's art or sport, all have the potential to include or exclude. So the question is really around how do we make them into invitations? Great. Yeah. And I, I think that's something that the Global Design Challenge did well is that it, it, the language throughout, you know, this is the one now that I've been involved in since the beginning, so I'm, I'm very familiar with it. But the language was always really welcoming and open and, you know, it was it was made in fun and it was made sound exciting. And, you know, even the idea of a challenge, there's there's a bit of play. It's gamified, you know, and you're like, oh, it's a challenge. Oh, there's a, there's a date, you know, so it, it lends a different kind of... Um, air to it than, you know, oh, go to soccer training on a Friday night or something like that, you know, It'd be like, I, 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 you know, that's me personally anyway, I go for the global design challenge more than the soccer training on the Friday night. We actually got a question from the audience um, for, and this is for Mr. Onor, um, it is what kind of sports are prioritised in Istanbul these days? Well, we are talking about Turkey and Istanbul. Of course, it's football. <laughs> I mean, uh, Actually, I mean, yes, football and no football. I mean, uh, in Turkey, football is the most talked, played, followed game. Uh, it's like eating all the other sport branches. Uh, so as municipality, uh, we are trying to support the uh, other branches uh, other than football. So if you ask me, for example, uh, among the... I just mentioned 17 branches. We are, we are teaching 17 branches to kids. 40% uh, of is swimming currently. And then it comes football, uh, basketball, volleyball, and gymnastic. I mean, those are the top five branches. And uh, we are trying to increase uh, gymnastics and athletism, uh, we are trying to, to extra support these two branches. 
but mainly that's all I can say. I mean, if you look at the culture, it's a football culture. Uh, but as municipality, I believe uh, we have to be supporting the other branches because I believe diversity is also valid for sport branches as well. I mean, there should be as many uh, branches available to kids that also supports uh, the success in uh, sport as well. I mean, uh, we probably you've seen many articles about that kids who has been told, uh, I mean, three or four different branches are more successful in uh, whatever they are doing in terms of sport. Yes, there are very specific sport branches like gymnastics. You should start at age three. You shouldn't be doing anything else, but I mean, that's an exception. Otherwise, uh, we are trying to support all the other branches uh, other than football. And at the moment, we're actually, I we, we, we tried to get a, another speaker on today as well, um, who's organising the Mixed Ability Rugby World Cup in Cork at the moment. Um, it was another uh, story that I covered back in my previous life um, for the TV show. So I, I could have been pulling out so much footage um, for this, this session uh, to mix it all in. But it's actually happening this week and it consists of a four day Mixed Ability Rugby tournament, which is taking place locally here, um, all of this this week and there are 24 men's teams participating and for the first time ever there's four women's teams with over a thousand players from 15 countries taking part a true international event and um, I suppose this this idea of mixed ability sports as well um, becoming one of the I suppose other areas for discussion and 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 a topic to bring up um, Professor Araki, do you think that there is are more opportunities or challenges for collaborating internationally for healthier, more sustainable mm -hmm. futures on the whole, the whole, um, every idea as well as for mixed ability sports? Well, <laughs> that's a tough question. Sorry. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> but uh, listening to uh, all, all the, uh, uh, the participants speaking, um, I, uh, well, um, I, I think um, the key uh, to success is uh, getting uh, getting together uh, the right kind of people, because um, uh, when it comes to uh, sporting event, uh, municipalities are good at. Uh, I, I understand that the, the city of Cork is uh, uh, actively uh, engaged in that, and uh, as you know, uh, the, the city of municipality of Tokyo. Uh, just hosted uh, the Olympic Games last year. It was called the Tokyo 2020, but it, it took, took place in 2021. But anyway, so uh, these uh, organizing sporting event it is actually conducted at, at the municipality level. But then um, at the universities, uh, we do have uh, many uh, uh, um, experts uh, uh, in sports, uh, the, the experts in physical education or the experts in uh, uh, the, 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 the letting those uh, handicapped students participate in more sporting activities, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, we are so much uh, compartmentalized. So uh, the, 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 there are uh, expertise uh, retained in universities, expertise retained in municipalities. But uh, in order to have a successful international uh, networking, probably we need to put together all those uh, resources and to, uh, to come up with uh, there's a meaningful project. And uh, th th that will be a quite a challenge. But uh, 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 finding the right kind of people and uh, uh, put, putting them together uh, would be a, probably a good start of, of organizing this kind of uh, international networking. So that probably that's all I can say at this juncture. Thank you. Excellent. And please feel free, anyone else now to jump in if, if you've anything else to add to anything. We have another question and answer to all panellists. What would your ideas and recommendations be to the planners of your respective port cities to address some of the challenges raised? Are there ways to encourage social inclusion, sport taking space in daily life, in addition to the event place examples that Yvonne has given? Yeah, please go ahead, Mr. Onar. 
Thank you. Uh, for the last one year, we are trying, we are uh, investing on open air exercises. Like currently, we are at uh, 20, 220 locations. So every morning in Istanbul, from 8 to 10, our trainers are going there and helping Istanbulians uh, exercise for an hour. Uh, I mean, that helps. First, it's free. Second, I mean, if you're doing something in a facility, no one is seeing it, so no one is motivated by that. But if you're at a park and giving this service, so people passing by, I mean, if not after one day, but seeing after seven times, I mean, they may say, okay, I'll give a try as well. Uh, I think that's also good for making PR of doing exercises. And... Uh, 70 to 80 percent of attendants are women and uh, we are also we've just finished our social return on investment report uh, we will be sending it to london uh, next week for accreditation and the results of open air exercises in social return on investment report was amazing i mean it's like we had a lot of stories from that uh, so i would recommend using these open air exercises now we are trying to add volunteers as well so that it could be more sustainable and also it will increase the community feeling as well and uh, so that's a project which i can highly recommend uh, for cities and i might go to you fiona about cities maybe where it rains more often um like here <laughs> right. um, you know <laughs> are, there, are there other ways yeah you see what i think and this is just the, with my design thinking hat on um I, I really love your answer by the way just what's happening in istanbul i think that works for istanbul and it, it may work in other areas i really like the idea though of creating bespoke um uh, events or activities for mm. local communities so even in Cork, and it's it's a small city, but it's a powerful city, uh, we have very, very different localities. And if we can empower people in those jurisdictions to try and come up with their own ideas that fit their sense of space. So I want to give you some sense of there, there are five different mega trends at the moment. And these are things that are really kind of anchor points that I'm going to call out. So the first one is around state of place. And that's what I'm speaking to now, that this idea that your local place is important. So for things to thrive and for flourish and to be sustainable, they, they really do need to have that local, I can recognize it, I know the people, this is ours, it belongs to our space. The second one is this idea where we're assisting people to, to basically exercise and to engage in physical activity without guilt. So the phrase they have for it is solace as service. So at the moment, we're starting to feel a little bit guilty about maybe wasting time exercising or moving or whatever and saying, oh, I still have to be busy and I have to do this or fill my emails or whatever it is. So maybe no, creating the space is okay. The idea of, and, and you have all called this out, uh, meaningful connections. Uh, so they call it joining. So creating opportunities for people to feel and foster connections that are genuine, supportive and meaningful. That comes from local communities, I believe. The idea, and you've all mentioned it as well, freedomism. And freedomism is, is this fun is powerful. We've talked about a play, creativity, uh, you're, you're exercising, and even the word exercise sounds loaded, uh, but you're moving and you're having fun. I talk about it as um, moving to learn and loving to move. That's my lovely tagline that I drag everywhere with me. And the last piece that we have to, to have if we're going to work as a city and empower um, our local communities to become physically active is uh, where digital and physical meet together. So we're often ignoring the bit where many of our generations are actually very locked into the digital and um, involved in maybe esports or other ways of, of consuming sport. And we need to really open our minds and our hearts to that. So otherwise, we're creating things for generations that that's fine. But we're, we're ignoring uh, the, the, the younger generations and people that probably are consuming things a little bit differently than we imagine. So I'd like us to go back to basics. I'd like us to have that empathy. I'd like us to create for our communities because I believe that's where sustainability will happen. And then, as you pointed rightly in, in, in um, when we talk about Istanbul, um, uh, Mr. Honor, the idea that um, you create um, something 
which may be showcased elsewhere. People may borrow your fantastic idea and spread the, the fabulous word, but often it's the small is beautiful local community um, engagement that might really have traction. And that's just from, from some of the experience that I might have. So thank you. Thank you, Fiona. And, you know, if I could just um, read out a, a, a Twitter post that I read this morning that I didn't see any connection to this event at all, by the way, until I listened to you all today. And it said, uh, bring back the habits that made you happy as a child. There's no reason ever that you should have to give up harmless things that bring you joy. You don't have to age out of having fun. Write mediocre fan fiction, questionable poetry, sing in the bath and while working in the yard and while washing your hands. Harm, hammer tunelessly on a piano, spin circles until you fall down, climb a tree. Just because you're now in charge of your life doesn't mean you're expected to give up on the things that make it, that make life feel worth living. And, you know, I just thought it was just a, such a powerful message. But again, I didn't think it had any connection to this event today. And that's what I'm kind of getting from all of you today is that movement, connection, feeling belonging, feeling social inclusion and solidarity. It's starting to make so much more sense to me from, you know, when I first read the what this what this seminar was called, I was like future of port cities, social. Blah, blah. It didn't really make a lot of sense. And now while I'm listening to all of you, I'm like, it totally makes sense. The penny has 100 percent dropped um, for me anyway in in uh, in my brain. So we only have a couple of minutes left, but I would like to throw this out to everyone and you can use your raise your hand or, or physically raise your hand. What are the ambitions for the future? What should we be thinking about? And you can take this from a societal point of view, from an academic researcher, entrepreneur point of view, or from a, me, a girl who, you know, cleans for physical activity, what what should I be doing? Um, so I'd love to hear anyone who would like to raise your hand and, and give an answer to that. Go ahead. Um, uh, go ahead, Mr. Onor. I think you raised first. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. I mean, I, uh, I mean, if the, if you ask me what's missing in Sport Istanbul or what are you dreaming of doing, I'm, uh, I highly support Ms. Chambers. I mean, we should be working more with NGOs, platforms or communities and support their projects. I mean, I follow Sport London quite closely. I see that they are quite good at doing that. And that's my dream project for next year. Uh, I mean, to find some funding and to start funding communities, groups, platforms, and NGOs, which are coming up with different ideas. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. And it also helps to increase the community spirit, which unfortunately is highly missing in Istanbul. That's also, uh, I mean, sport is I mean, uniting and to feel this effect. The community based projects are key for cities like Istanbul, I believe. Thank you. Great. Anyone else like to unmute yourself? Go ahead, Fiona. Sorry, and I promise I won't hog the microphone. And um, my, 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 I suppose the thing that I would push and really drive forward is this idea of educating everybody as an innovator or design thinker. So if I had a magic wand, I would be trying to get that way of thinking and that empathy into schools to empower young people to really have that autonomy over their lives. So it's, it's building the, the mindset. And um, the other thing that I would say as well is I'd like us to connect better this kind of idea of cognitive diversity. So you said spoke really, really beautifully about it, um, Professor Araki, about the, the idea of bringing the right people together. And for me, they're people who are very diverse. And I always link in with Mary Oxman, um, the MIT professor, who talks about the intersection of art, design, engineering and science. So it's that we work together to try and create amazing solutions for our communities in our cities that look and feel beautiful and can offer those opportunities, not just for competitive sport, but play and creativity. So the education piece and this lovely diversity of thought intersecting. Um, and I think then we might be onto something. Um, yeah, so that's me. Would anyone else like to go? Go I, ahead, Jeff. I think just to again echo what Fiona was mentioning, I think Steve Jobs was mentioning that great things are never done by one single person, but by a team, a network mm. of people. 
And I think in order for us, because uh, society is evolving all the time, change is, is a constant. And for us to unify, you know, the new generation, technology, the new Web3, sport, and unity, it has to be done by a group of people who comes together. And unity always achieves things. Uh, and that's what I will be hopeful. The exercise verse. You, you go in with your, you know, 3D goggles and, and do some um, exercise. I suppose the Wii actually was probably a good, the Nintendo Wii was a good... Um... Yeah, the Nintendo Wii, and I know Apple is going to launch some kind of augmented reality. And look, you could push away technology. Technology is there, and the way it's a tool. It, it, it's, you know, and this tool can augment people's life or can impact people negatively. However, I think education, especially educating the young generation on technology and how to use technology to better society and to use technology for fitness. I mean, look at, for example, um, what was it? Uh, that was Pokemon Go. The amount of people who use Pokemon Go as exercises, suddenly people are doing kilometers of work just to try to find a Pokemon somewhere. And that's absolutely fantastic. And that's a very good example of how technology can leverage and bring people together. And uh, I think we, we need to embrace that. Very good. Yeah, one of my friends, like at 10 o'clock and he looks at his um, his watch and he's like, 9,500 steps. <laughs> and then he starts walking around the house like a maniac for the last 500. Um, I'm just going to go to Professor Iraqi first and then Yvonne, just for some final closing out comments about the ambition um, that you'd like or the changes, I suppose, that you'd like to see in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, ambition. <laughs> I, I don't know. Actually, uh, to, uh, I, I am I am no longer involved in uh, uh, the, the the Port City Invest League per se, but um, of course, uh, and and I'll be retiring uh, in two years, so I, I don't know <laughs> what my ambition uh, um, is uh, in in terms of this uh, international networking. But uh, yeah, the ho hopefully um, the uh, we, we can expand um, our international network, and th that will probably uh, hopefully. Uh, contribute to um, the, well, the, the well, uh, should I say, a more peaceful world. For example, uh, well, come come to think of it, uh, when we were uh, discussing the uh, the start of this league, uh, actually, uh, U University of Odessa was uh, one possible candidate. Probably, it will take years or me even decades. <laughs> for us uh, to approach uh, Odessa uh, to be part of the league. But um, th th that's something uh, we have to keep in mind. Uh, and so uh, networking is really important. Thank you. Very good. And uh, and thank and well done and congratulations um, on your re upcoming retirement in two years time. There's still two years <laughs> left, though, for a more peaceful world. So uh, it was great to, to get you on today. And uh, Yvonne, if I could get your closing statements, please. I think um what we have um, to bring to the table of this dialogue can be summed up as the aesthetics of the invitation. That's a phrase I take from Martin White, a theater theorist who talks about what makes people who are participating, naive participants, new participants in interactive performance, the kind of thing that fills people with dread, that they might go to a theater and someone would make them do something on stage when they actually just want to sit in an audience. And um, that actually the way people are invited, the message space sends, the messages and the exact nature of the message that organizers of activities send, that actually um, the shape the flavor, the smell of those invitations has a really strong influence on whether people respond. So I think if our municipal governments, if our um, larger supranational governments, if our own institutions um, pay more attention to how the hand that invites to activity is extended, then many more people are likely to extend a hand in return. And, um, yeah, and, and the extension of the hand is a kind of performance. Beautiful answer. Thank you so much. Really, really lovely. I really enjoyed today's conversation. I Just before we go, I just want to throw up one slide about the Global Design Challenge. Um, because, you know, we, we're speaking about a lot of what 
you know, people outside of our control can do, but what you can do within your control um, today is actually register for the Global Design Challenge 2022 and take part team up with people from all over the world and try to come up with ideas through this amazing design thinking methodology which again I wasn't aware of before I met Fiona and you know there's a lot of training in there as well like it's not just you know you come up with an idea and and let us know it's like we'll help you along the way we'll give you the tools you need to try and come up with ideas and, and make friends from all over the world and potentially have something that could catch on and go completely global and you know the new Oculus or as, as Renee mentioned um, or you know the new Wii or something like that or it could be an app it could be anything so there's a warm up event resources there and um, it is like I suppose an hour or three hours sorry of different speakers going through it and uh, it's all broken up into sections they've done a great job um, in kind of pulling this event um, together and then sorry actually the global design challenge for sport and you can watch the video on it because I, I, do, I want to be respectful of your time I'm already six minutes over but there's a brilliant video on there that, that, that explains it really well. Thank you to all of the event organisations that took part today and especially thank you as well to UCC Civic and Community Engagement and Kira O'Halloran who is behind the scenes getting in touch with all the speakers, putting the Zoom together, putting the, you know, the, 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 the text together for everyone and, and just really kind of unifying the whole lot into one talk. Thank you to all of our amazing and wonderful speakers. I certainly learned a huge amount today and I really appreciate your time and finally thank you to Cork Harbour Festival for you know putting this on and making this happen and and connecting us um, in, in a new way so thank you very much everyone have a great rest of your day